Okay. So we can continue now um, with the rest of the program. We will now have a session uh, up to quarter past three, um, where we will be seeing the experiences of existing heavy iron therapy um, uh, systems and research infrastructures. We will also see their future plans and upgrades. Uh, um, and we will start with Esther Orlandi from Knau with the clinical experience on benefits of heavy iron therapy. Esther, you have the floor. Hey, I am Esther Orlandi. I'm the chief uh, of oncological uh, radiotherapy department uh, in Knau. A moment, please. Okay. Uh, I would like to, to give you some, uh, some uh, data of uh, Knau clinical experience. Uh, now, um, okay, start uh, the clinical activity in uh, January 2014. Uh, the first patient, uh, the, the first patient uh, treated with uh, carbon ion uh, was uh, a young uh, patient with uh, uh, cordoma of the skull of the skull basis. And uh, uh, starting from January uh, 2014, uh, um, carbon ion therapy as well as uh, um, photon therapy um, are considered a treatment uh, um, refounded for our natural earth system. Uh, Okay, I would like to uh, give you some, some, some a couple of number. Uh, you, we, we have treated uh, at the beginning of our activity more than um, uh, 32,000 patients. Uh, you can see that the majority of patients uh, were treated for a first diagnosis uh, and about um, 25% of patients receive uh, treatment, uh, both proton or carbon ion, for recurrent disease. Um, and you can see that uh, the majority of patients uh, receive uh, carbon ion therapy. We have uh, a patient uh, receiving uh, a mixed beam approach, uh, including the proton and the carbon ion. Um, in this figure, uh, you can see the um, cancer dis distribution. Um, about uh, um, the 50 percent of patients uh, treated in now um, have uh, cancer, rare cancer, rare and uh, resistant um, cancer of the head and neck uh, uh, area. Um, the, the most frequent uh, uh, cancer in uh, the neck region are uh, squamous cellular carcinoma. And uh, the tower tumors are usually treated with the photon based radiotherapy with or without concomitant chemotherapy according to uh, the stage. Uh, in now we treat uh, um, no uh, squamous cellular carcinoma so far, but uh, uh, salivary gland cancers and uh, paranasal uh, sinuses cancers. Um, there are uh, um, tumors uh, very rare. Um, rare means a tumors a tumor with an incidence uh, lower than 6%. Uh, um, and uh, in the majority of cases, uh, we um, uh, speak about uh, salivary gland cancer. Um, among these, uh, we consider adenoidocystic carcinoma and high-grade non-adenoidocystic carcinoma and the low grade uh, known adenocystic carcinoma. Among the coronal sinus cancer, we, uh, we uh, have uh, um, epithelial non-glandular 
um, carcinoma like uh, uh, I differentiate the carcinoma, um, aden adenocarcinoma uh, and mucosal melanoma. So 50% uh, of patients uh, receive a treatment for, for this uh, disease. Uh, you can see um, other uh, site distribution and uh, um, we have, uh, um, this is, uh, this is uh, uh, the number of patients treated uh, in the last year. Um, another um, important um, pathology is represented by uh, skull base, chordoma and chondrosarcoma. Uh, as well as uh, patients with uh, pelvis uh, sarcoma and patients uh, with uh, um, sarcoma and chordoma on the spine and uh, the sarcoma. Okay, this is distribution according to type of a particle used and for uh, the neck cancer, uh, so in the meantime, uh, can I continue to, to with my speech? Okay. Absolutely. Uh, okay. Um, I spoke about uh, the, the radio resistance and the rarity of uh, uh, the tumors are treated with uh, carbon ions. Uh, this is because uh, this tumor have uh, in their radiobiology um, the features uh, um, that, uh, that uh, uh, can be uh, treated with uh, carbon ion and uh, the tower in line with the radiobiological characteristics of uh, carbon ion. Um, I, um, um, everybody knows uh, the dosimetric and the physical properties of, uh, of carbon ion. But uh, carbon ion have a distinct biological property of uh, um, high linear energy transfer, okay? And uh, um, for, um, for, for carbon ion uh, therapy, the dose uh, um, is uh, usually uh, expressed in uh, um, um, radio biological equ equivalent effectiveness uh, and uh, it is uh, expressed uh, as a photon equivalent dose uh, calculated by multiplying the particle beam physical uh, dose. Uh, sorry to interrupt you, but we don't see your screen. We are not sharing. Uh, I know, but uh, I, I'm not able to, to, to share the screen. Can you please uh, send us by email? Sure. And we are okay. going to post it, okay? Okay. Uh, meantime, Nicholas, maybe we can uh, go to the next presentation. And uh, Esther is going to send us by email her own, and we are going to post it, okay? We will just very briefly uh, tell you um, what has been our approach as a new facility, starting with, with proton and then carbon. And then, then my colleague, Dr. Tubin, will tell you some more detail uh, of a new approach, which is one of the, the uh, projects we have for the future. So for the beginning, um, the proton, one may say, is the natural evolution of uh, IMRT. Radiotherapy is always going toward more conformality, and proton is a sort of super IMRT, even more conformal than IMRT, and it is uh, um, um, gaining uh, more and more momentum uh, with facilities uh, being opened up, not only in big academic centers, but also in small community hospitals. And we may say this is uh, basically an unstoppable uh, natural evolution. Carbon is somewhat different, that the key uh, issue of carbon is this additional efficacy due to a different kind of damage down at the microscopic level, which are different in terms of uh, repair possibilities. And so it is uh, something different and the experience is smaller. We believe that um, if we don't have a strong reason to use carbon, then we should stick to proton or photon. And the strong reason is 
we use carbon when we are not satisfied about the local control we can achieve with protons. So this means that we use carbon only to treat macroscopic tumor, not for purely adjuvant treatment, sterilizing the, the post-operative bed, then we stick to protons. We don't use carbon for tumors in which the local control is very good with protons or with uh, um, photon radiochemotherapy. And um, we use carbon if we believe that the local control can have an impact uh, for the patient. So, so this means that mostly we do curative treatment of a, a non-metastatic disease, but sometimes uh, uh, nowadays in modern oncology, we have to acknowledge that also the oligometastatic patient can have a very long prognosis. So, so in very selective case, we even treat um, to oligometastatic patients. So our approach is basically to try to take the best of the existing experience. So in some case, we have to, to um, follow the, the dose and fractionation established by the Japanese colleagues. And in some case, we follow the dose and fractionation established by the German colleagues in Heidelberg. And of course, there are other cases, and you will hear more from Dr. Tubin, in which we try to use carbon in a new way. Now, if we want to go uh, the German way, then uh, in uh, Medaus, like all the European facilities, we have the same radiobiological model as they um, used in Heidelberg. So, so we can simply take the numbers and apply them. It is not different from people using photons. When, when um, um, colleagues in, in Texas started to have wonderful results with SBRT for lung cancer, well, all the world simply copied um, Dr. Timmerman prescription and we were happy, but we cannot do that if we want to follow the Japanese way because of the different RB model. So if we know that uh, uh, 64 grade, 16 fraction of 4 grade RB in Japan uh, give us a good control for adenocystic carcinoma, well, we cannot do the same. We have to translate these RB from the Japanese to the European model. <laughs> so because you understand that with carbon ion, um, um, no matter if you treat a simple SOBP1 field or if you treat a complex field, of course, you all know that, that uh, there will be an inhomogeneous field of particle in each voxel in the patient. So each voxel gets a mix of different things. And from the very simplistic uh, um, the medical doctor point of view, this mix means uh, some dose is delivered by slow particles that are stopping there, slow carbon ion at the end of the range. They do uh, dense ionizing uh, damage. So, so, so they break chemical um, bonds in a scale which is smaller than the DNA double helix. So, so uh, a lot of damage in a couple of bays, hard to recognize, hard to repair. And some of the doses delivered by, by fast particles or by fragments that are just passing by to stop elsewhere, and they deliver a dose which produce um, sparse ionization. So similar to low LET, so you get a, 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 a killing only if you by chance get one single strand break from one particle and another from another particle. So this is the normal uh, non-linear dependency on those we are used and uh, a lot of different capabilities of repair. So we have a mix of something which is linear, non-repairable, and something which is non-linear, repairable. A mix of something that looks like neutrons and a mix of something that looks like um, uh, protons or photons. Where we have a lot of stopping particles, then we have more killing. When we don't have a lot of stopping particles, we have less killing. We all agree that to avoid um, um, uh, having uh, um, 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 unpredictable results, well, we have to put less physical dose where there is a lot of efficacy and more where there is not so much efficacy. But there are two ways of doing it. The Japan way, which is the Kanai semi-empirical model and subsequently the modified micro dosimetric kinetic model as published by Dr. Inaniwa to keep consistency. So all in all, we call this MKM, but it is the Japanese way consistent with itself or the German way with this local effect model. Not, um, it's impossible to say one is good, the other is bad. Uh, both models have major approximation. Both models uh, are disregarding the heterogeneity inside the tumor and the heterogeneity between one patient and another. N neither of them is good or bad, but you have to link the model to the clinical data and to the prescription and to the constraints for organs at risk. So, so you cannot pretend that these numbers are not different. Uh, and we, uh, uh, and when I say we, it means uh, first um, the, the group in NIRS and in CNAO, and now I moved from CNAO to my DAO, so and so I'm continuing to do this. So it is really a nice cooperation. And then GSI also somehow participated in this. So, so the whole community, we are trying to uh, find a way to, to um, translate from Japanese to uh, European languages. So the first step was simply um, prescribing a dose that minimizes the difference in physical underlying dose. This is what we did 10 years ago um, between CNAO and 
needs. And the second step was recomputing Japanese doors using the LAM. And at that time, this involved making a Fluca Monte Carlo simulation of the entire NIRS beam line, including the, the, um, the personalized the passive collimators and compensators and the CT. So, so this was extremely complex and time consuming. And then in the end, we could confirm that the conversion we had um, um, found was not uh, wrong. And then there was the third step, and again, each step took years in which we were able to implement MKM together with Fluca. So we could not only recompute the Japanese dose in terms of the European description, but also recompute the European dose in terms of the Japanese description. But finally, we are now at step four. It will no longer be something for which you need a full room. Um, 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 a whole room full of physicists that do only this, it will be possible to do this inside the commercial TPS. And this will allow validating the, this conversion among several uh, um, uh, centers with, with larger number of patients. So why is this so relevant? Because if you say 4.4 gray RB of carbon ion, well, this is not the same as 4.4 gray of photons and 4.4 gray RB in Japan are not the same as in uh, uh, Europe. And over the 10 years, we have established a modality to translate. And this is, um, um, we feel, something that must be very clear for anyone coming um, um, as a newcomer to this field. So this means that prescription has to be changed when they say 4.4 gray uh, times 16 is needed to control sarcoma. This is true in Japan. But to do the same in Italy or in um, Austria or in Germany, we have to give 4.8. So 10%, between 10 to 15% more. And uh, if we um, do that and keep the same dose constraints for organs, then we are too conservative. Here you see an, an effort that, again, when I started uh, with colleagues in now, and I'm trying to continue in Austria, in which we are um, um, going to, to examine specifically the dose constraints for organs at risk based on observed clinical toxicity and see what does it mean in terms of LEM or MKM doses. So this is a, a, a nice work on the optic nerve. And then 45 gray in terms of MKM in Japan should be translated in 50 gray in terms of LEM in Europe. If we stick to 45, we are too conservative. We are not giving enough dose to the tumor. And in the very beginning, of course, we saw uh, no uh, um, um, optic neuropathy, but, but some uh, recurrence close to the optic nerve that was spared too much. So, so we are trying to improve on this. We recently published a, a summary of, of this issue with constraints for uh, optic uh, for, sorry, for, for head and neck organs at risk in IJPT. So this has just been accepted and you will be able to see it. And it is a nice summary, but, but this will be part of the work within the project E3 plus to extend this to, to a multi-centric analysis with many patients. So, so um, based on this, what are we treating uh, in, in um, um, Medaustron? We are treating uh, in the beginning, the usual indication, non squamocellular head and neck tumors. Um, non-operable sarcoma, uh, selected uh, intrapelvic recurrence, for example, rectal cancer. This is what we have started to do, for example, ray radiation. And for head and neck, well, if we believe that no elective nodal irradiation is needed, then we follow the Japanese approach. But the 3.6 slash 4 gray per fraction in Japan becomes for us 4.1 slash 4.3. Um, and if instead we believe that uh, we need to give um, elective nodal irradiation to the bilateral atrocervical neck, then we go for the German way, 50 gray of low LET. This can be photons, can be protons, and then a boosted three gray per fraction. So, so um, we hope that in the future we will all agree on an, a, an, a better stratification instead of a, a soccer uh, team supporter approach in which either you only follow Japan or you only follow Germany. And for um, the sarcomas, we are mainly following Japan, but, but the 4.4 uh, gray per fraction becomes, uh, when you translate from MKM to LEM, 4.8. But we, um, in a very important exception, follow the German approach, and it is for skull base chordoma, where we believe that, that the um, limiting factor is the ability to, to uh, spare the um, uh, brain stem, and we have um, a smaller difference and we, we believe we have better understanding of the brainstem toxicity for skull-based chordoma. We follow the, Jap the, the German fractionation. And um, uh, for the sake of time, we skip about this. If I have three more minutes ju just to, to um, go from theoretical to practical, I very briefly present you one case of what 
is the typical uh, um, um, refer uh, patient that you may see when you start a carbon facility. Uh, this is a young woman that uh, uh, had uh, some pain in the uh, gluteal areas and they discovered the, a rather um, large osteosarcoma. She received chemotherapy according to the Euramos protocol and surgery was excluded because it would have been a permanent colostomy, permanent rostomy, so double incontinence and possibly a significant loss of function of the limb, so, so a permanent uh, limp, maybe even wheelchair. The patient refused this and also the surgeon was not really pushing for that, so we treated with Japanese fraction nation. And this is um, partially imported from Japan and partially a, a step further because you see the very nice target coverage, but you also see that we are trying to spare the nerve roots. One of the bad uh, toxicity of this uh, high-dose pelvic irradiation for sarcoma in Japan was the, the late neuropathy. And this is again a, a shared project that, that we started in now and trying to, to continue in, in Austria, in which we try selectively to spare the nerve roots, which you can very nicely do with spot scanning carbon. And I'm not aware of any other modalities that allows you to do that. And for this young patient, we are also trying to spare the ovaries. So, so again, we have cases of, of this high dose pelvic sarcoma treated in Japan, and then the patient could successfully carry out a pregnancy. Um, now, the patient had no toxicity at the end of treatment, and we have six months stable disease in terms of radiological response, but um, complete metabolic response. So you can see the high PET uptake before treatment that is completely uh, uh, gone. So, so there is no more metabolic activity in this tumor. So, so this is a very brief because of time uh, constraints an uh, overview of what we are doing and why. And now I would like to give uh, the floor to my colleague uh, Slavica that will present you uh, one of the uh, several new things that we hope to develop in the mid and the long term. Before we continue with Slavica, um, we will see if there are any questions and then we will proceed with Esther to finish her presentation, if it's okay, of course, um, for Slavica. Um, are there any questions for Pietro? Yes. Why is there no international protocol which could be followed everywhere? You mean regarding the dose, uh, the, the RBE dose? Yes. Um, um, well, uh, in the, um, it's just for historical reason. There has recently been a, a, a ICRU uh, report on carbon ion and the ICRU report on carbon ion concluded that uh, um, the Japanese uh, RB model and the German RB model, um, we cannot say that one is better than the other, and they are both linked to substantial know-how in the facility that use them. And so um, also according to, to official ICRU recommendation, you can select um, the model you want as long as you clearly specify which model you have selected and which are the parameters you are using. So, so it, it, the, the two countries started uh, independently and um, each uh, went their own way. And now it is basically impossible to convince uh, the German to follow the Japanese uh, way or the Japanese to follow the, the uh, European way. There is also a bright side to it because only one model, then especially the newcomer, could be um, mistaken into believing that, that the RBE is a real uh, known and certain uh, value. Uh, having two models uh, um, is somehow that makes um, every one of us aware of the underlying um, basic uncertainty in this uh, in this uh, uh, RBE. How do you decide which patients receive carbon treatment? What are the most common indications? Do you treat with carbons? Um, this is also a very good uh, question. As said, basically, um, um, we don't treat a pediatric tumor with carbons. We don't treat post-operative tumors uh, with carbon. And we don't treat tumors in which the local control is good with carbon. So we don't treat meningioma. We don't treat lymphoma. We don't treat um, um, radiosensitive sarcoma like rhabdomyosarcoma in viewing. This we all treat with protons. We do treat with carbon tumors in which um, we are not mm, 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 happy with the, the protons results. So inoperable bone and soft tissue sarcoma with the possible exclusion of rhabdomyosarcoma and viewing, 
um, inoperable non squamocellular head and neck tumor. So for head and neck uh, tumor, the, the 90% of, of the tumor squamocellular uh, radiochemotherapy with either photon and proton is a good result. But for salivary gland cancer, especially adenoid cystic carcinoma, but also other histologies for mucosal melanoma, for, for uh, sarcoma in the head and neck, for, for odontogenic tumor like ameloblastoma, the results are absolutely not um, satisfactory. Uh, we use carbon ion for recurrent, uh, local recurrent uh, of rectal cancer. And again, this is based on radioresistance and preliminary very good data. There are gray zones. For example, hepatocellular carcinoma is a very good indication for particles, but the results are absolutely equivalent with protons or with carbon. The only advantage is that carbon is one week treatment and proton is possibly a three or four weeks treatment. So, so you may decide uh, based on availability. A and then the big question, uh, you may say the elephant in the room is prostate cancer. Prostate has been the, the, um, the most common indication in Japan and it is recognized and reimbursed in Japan. But in Europe, there is a lot of, uh, let's say, suspicion and um, um, referral for prostate is a very politically loaded issue. So, so uh, we hope that we will be able internationally to, to design some um, trial with Western methodology to, to really confirm that the advantage for high risk cross that uh, shown by Japanese series is real. And this may become a, a very important indication in the future. Piero, thank you so much for your presentation and for answering these questions. We will now move on to our previous um, presentation. Um, um, thank you, Piero. Um, we will continue now with Esther Orlandi with the clinical experience from now. Okay, thank you. I apologize for the inconvenience. Uh, can we restart uh, from the clinical experience? Uh, Piero already spoke about um, dosimetric and biological properties of carbonyl. So we can uh, uh, next, 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 next. Uh, um, we can see the slide. Uh, uh, titled uh, scale based cordoma or adenocystic cordoma. Next, uh, again, uh, so we, 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 have, uh, we have discussed uh, about uh, biological properties uh, of uh, carbon ions that. Uh, meet uh, biological features uh, of uh, radioresistant tumor, uh, considering uh, not only uh, an uh, innate uh, radioresistance, uh, but also uh, radioresistance, uh, radioresistance uh, acquired from uh, um, photon-based therapy. Again, again, next, next, okay, next, next. Please, next, next again, next, 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 okay, it's okay, it's okay, uh, previous one, okay. Um, previous one, I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, skull base uh, cordoma. This is a very rare tumor uh, with uh, low proliferation. Um, and it is uh, one of the, the tumor uh, for which uh, um, published data uh, um, are present uh, when uh, um, treating with uh, uh, protons and the carbon ions. This is our uh, experience, uh, published uh, the last year on uh, neuro-oncology. Um, the, the, the population uh, was composed uh, by more than 100 patients. Uh, you can see that the patients uh, receive uh, a treatment uh, both uh, protons and carbon ions. Uh, um, as primary diagnosis uh, for about 80% of cases and uh, uh, in case of recurrence, local recurrence uh, in 20% of cases. Uh, in uh, um, the majority of cases, uh, treatment uh, was uh, delivered in post-operative setting uh, 
e in uh, the majority of cases uh, surgery was uh, um, resection was incomplete microscopically incomplete this means that uh, um, positive uh, multiple positive uh, surgical margin there were at histology or microscopic residual of disease uh, there was uh, after um, at histology okay um, the um, fractionation you can see the fractionation uh, we use a uh, standard uh, fractionation, so with sugar hyperfraction with the bottom therapy uh, and uh, hyperfractionation with uh, 70.4 grays equivalent in 16, in 16 fraction for uh, carbon ions. This is, uh, this is uh, uh, the data on uh, uh, clinical outcomes. Uh, uh, um, as for local control and uh, survival. Uh, our data are uh, in, in line with the Japanese experience as uh, spoke by Piero, um, fractionation schedules in now um, were uh, um, the same uh, um, that uh, uh, Japanese experience. Um, local control was very high, in particular with uh, um, L0 patients. Uh, in general, protons uh, um, are uh, well delivered. Uh, this is uh, the same for uh, all tumors, as, as, as spoken by Kiero. Protons are delivered in case of uh, uh, L0 disease, so when surgery is uh, complete, uh, or in case uh, of uh, one single uh, uh, positive surgical margin. Whereas a carbon ions is delivered, usually delivered when a macroscopic disease uh, is present. And you can see the good uh, toxicity profile. Uh, 11% uh, of patients had the late uh, severe toxicity, in particular neurological toxicity. Next. Okay, this is uh, uh, the experience uh, um, of uh, scalbase or chondrosarcoma patients. Uh, this is a very, very rare disease. Uh, um, but uh, with uh, a, a low uh, proliferation, uh, uh, you um, we treated 50% uh, or 50 patients. Uh, in this case, uh, um, half of patients had radiotherapy in the definitive setting and in post-operative setting. Uh, the fractionation was the same. Um, was a senior that uh, uh, Cordoma um, population, uh, and in this case, uh, local control survival was very, very high. Also for uh, scalvase and chondrosarcoma, the clinical results were in line with the Japanese and the Heidelberg experience. And for uh, as regard to toxicity, you can see that uh, um, percentage of uh, severe rate toxicity uh, was uh, low. Um, 60%, 6% uh, of patients had uh, neuropathic toxicity. Next. Okay, we have recently uh, reviewed uh, our experience on adenocystic uh, carcinoma. This is the most common tumor of salivary gland cancer. Um, we have treated uh, more than uh, um, 2,050 patients. In the majority of cases, uh, in, uh, in, at primary diagnosis, but uh, uh, we have uh, a certain percentage of patients with uh, recurrence. Uh, you can see that uh, in this case, uh, patients had uh, macroscopic disease uh, when uh, received uh, treatment, uh, only 30% um, of patients received uh, biopsy, uh, so the, the disease was uh, in, uh, in sight. And uh, um, other 
50% of patients receive incomplete resection. Uh, you can see that uh, progression to survival, low survival, but also local control was very high. And uh, in uh, this uh, um, series, uh, uh, the, the, one of the, 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 the most important uh, finding was that patients uh, um, receiving a carbon ion after um, we, uh, with a uh, microscopic disease had a poor prognosis compared to patients uh, receiving uh, uh, carbon ion uh, in, in, in operable cases. This means that uh, um, carbon ion could be an optimal option to treat the patients with a very advanced disease and uh, um, very advanced disease and uh, disease better than uh, try to try to um, perform a surgical intervention when patients are when patients have very very advanced disease, and we now recorded a severe neurological toxicity. We follow Japanese vaccination. But uh, for patients uh, with uh, the cystic carcinoma or cerebral gland carcinoma uh, arising from uh, anatomical sites uh, with uh, uh, an important uh, um, lymph node uh, um, basin, we consider also to irradiate uh, um, precautionary uh, nodal volume. We um, are developing a, a CIBA strategy, a CIBA means uh, simultaneous integrated boost strategy uh, for uh, um, salivary gland tumors, uh, including uh, um, a different uh, attraction size for different uh, uh, target volumes for uh, um, a low risk target volume, including a microscopic perineural invasion or when indicated uh, nodal volumes. Nodal volume, we consider a dose per fraction about, uh, we, 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 we can consider a dose per fraction uh, of uh, 3.5 uh, gray equivalents. Whereas the macroscopic disease is uh, um, treated with a dose per fraction of uh, 4.1 grays. Next. Okay. The disease is not concluding. This is the, this is the last, the, the, the last uh, slide. Um, this is the experience uh, in, with uh, carbon ion in a recurrent salivary gland cancer. Uh, this clinical scenario is very complicated to, to manage. Um, only in a low percentage of cases, uh, uh, patients uh, are uh, eligible for uh, radical surgery. So you can see um, this. Um, since in the majority of cases, uh, uh, recurrence, uh, recurrences are in advanced stages. This is our experience uh, with uh, carbon ion, with uh, patients uh, with the recurrent disease uh, were treated with a median dose of 60 grays. Okay, in, uh, in this in um, analysis, uh, the growth target volume, uh, meaning the extension of microscopic disease, was uh, um, a prognostic factor on outcome. But uh, progression-free survival and growth survival were higher compared to um, surgical series. So also in this clinical scenario, uh, carbon ion represents uh, uh, a good, uh, a good options. Okay. 
I finish my, my speech. Thank you, Esther. Uh, let's see if we have any questions for Esther, quickly. Um, Nicholas, we have no questions actually. We have no so questions. We can continue. Yeah. Esther, thank, thank you, you so Esther. much for your presentation. Okay. Um, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we now move on to our next uh, talk. Uh, it is a pleasure for me to invite uh, Saviza Tuba from Medaustron to give us um, um, uh, a lecture about particle therapy approach exploring the synergies between carbon ion. And Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you very much. It will be my pleasure. But I receive here. I see the message. Somebody is asking uh, if. Uh, no, that was me. that was me. We've resolved that, so we can proceed with yours if you are. Okay, there is no problem, really. If you want, uh, we will continue as as uh, is indicated in the program. Okay, so ten minutes are not much time, and my topic is highly specific. So let's move. Um, can I, I cannot move the presentation? Yes, I can. So everybody hear me, everybody can see what I share? Yes, we can hear you loud and clear and we can see what you're sharing. All right, so the available data on um, interaction between radiation and the immune system in oncologic patients are controversial or at least seems to be uh, as they show the bipolarity of radiotherapy being able both to exert immunostimulatory and immunosuppressive effects. Which immunogenic scenario, um, um, immunostimulatory or suppressive respectively will take place may depend on several factors such as um, radiation type, technique, um, dose fractionation, treatment volume, and etc. cetera. Um, conventional radiotherapy, for example, with less immunogenic radiation dose of uh, 1.8 to 2 gray per fraction that are repeatedly delivered over a long time to the usually larger tissue volumes um, will result in an immunosuppressive effect usually. But um, SBRT uh, or SBRT-like techniques delivered as a high dose to small volume and thus limiting the exposure of immune cells to eye radiation typically given in limited time corresponding to one to five days may enhance the immune response by shifting the uh, radiation immunomodulatory potential toward immunostimulation. Several evidence show that the carbon ion irradiation exerts stronger immunogenic effects than the proton or photon radiotherapy, like in this article, for example, in terms of irradiation, um, uh, calreticulin exposure, uh, which is a hallmark of immunogenic cell death. Um, here in Medaustron, we are exploring the synergies between the carbon ions and immune response in terms of the bystander and upscopal effects or so-called radiation-induced immune-mediated anti-tumor effects of radiation. We develop novel concept aimed to improve the radiation immunogenic potential by mixing all the most immunogenic radiotherapy characteristics in one approach called carbopathy. Uh, pathy is for the partial tumor irradiation targeting exclusively hypoxic tumor segment. In this approach, a very high, thus immunogenic radiation dose is delivered with carbon ions to the hypoxic tumor segment for which we believe that is the most immunogenic tumor part at the right timing in respect to the most reactive immune response phase, sparing at the same time the local regional peritumoral immune cells, uh, what we are calling like PIM structure, uh, peritumoral immune microenvironment that we uh, start to consider as a real new organ at risk that needs to be spared and that usually is not spared and thus killed by the conventional whole tumor radiotherapy. Um, this concept implies that for an effective immune modulation leading to improved therapeutic ratio, the entire tumor volume may not need to be irradiated, but only a partial tumor volume to initiate the immune cycle in radiation spared PIM structure, resulting in tumoricidal bystander and abscopal effects. The aim of the treatment is to add to the direct radiation tumor cell killing, also an additional immune mediated tumor cell killing component in terms of bystander and abscopal effects like in this case that you can see here, 
uh, of a patient that is successfully treated with this approach, you can see, for example, that this dominant bulky mass, PET positive mass, we have been treated partially uh, with the high dose, like 10 gray, three times to 70% isodose line. In addition, patient had multiple lymph node metastases that you can see here that are PET positive, and all they are gone following the partial irradiation of the dominant, let's say, mother uh, tumor lesion. Um, um, the critical part, um, sorry, um, the critical part of the research is the timing of radiation uh, to be delivered since the anti-tumor immune response homeostatically oscillates, repeatedly switching on and off in a cyclical manner. We are assessing practically the blood markers as predictors of the immune system activity, trying to synchronize the carbopathy with the most reactive phase of the immune response in order to increase the probability for the radiation immunogenic potential. Um, this is what we call the time-synchronized immune-guided uh, carbopathy treatment. In addition to the clinical research, we are studying also the molecular mechanisms behind the PATHY approach in order to understand how this treatment affects the immune system in terms of immune stimulation. We found that partial tumor irradiation induced very dense tumor infiltration of the BNT lymphocytes, especially in that uh, peritumoral radiation spared PIM region. We found also that the PATHY approach is able of inducing the apoptosis program tumor cell death, both of the partially treated tumor as well as the distant anti-radiated tumor because of the induced abscopal effect. Also, we found that following the partial irradiation of bulky tumor, the anti-irradiated metastatic tumor sites showed a strong expression of the cell death-inducing cytokines being probably produced by an activated immune system cells and responsible for the abscopal effect. Now we are running the phase one, two prospective trial with the aim to assess the immunogenic potential of carbon ions used for a partial tumor irradiation in terms of the bystander and abscopal response rate. 23 patients will be involved in this trial. Prescription dose will be 12 gray RBE three times, so up to 36 uh, total dose gray. Um, for the hypoxic target definition, we will use the ATSM PET CT. And for the purpose of the timing of carbon patty, we will use the predictive markers like interleukin-2, interferon gamma, lymphocyte monocyte ratio, CRP, and LDH. So that would be shortly about our novel approach um, for, for exploration of the carbon ion immunogenic potential in terms of partial tumor irradiation. So it will be now my pleasure uh, to respond to your questions, if any. Thank you so much for that very interesting presentation. Please, Do we have I just any want questions? to, to tell you. Uh, yeah, unfortunately, like I said, this is a highly specific topic and, you know, it probably would require a little bit more time uh, to discuss about the details. So I, I hope that the message, at least the basic message arrived. We have one question. Yes, Can I you see clarify so, the difference between right. the bystander plus the So look, abscopal. bystander and abscopal effects are the group of so-called non-targeted effects of radiotherapy. Imagine if we have the lung cancer and the lymph node metastasis. So if we treat the lung cancer and we see then the regression of the distant lymph node metastasis, for example, we say these are distant non-targeted effects or abscopal effects. Bystander is the same, but is the local phenomenon. So local non-targeted effects, meaning in the case of this approach, if I treat partially only, uh, for example, on an average one third of the tumor mass, and if I induce then the regression of the whole tumor, also at the periphery where I didn't target it with irradiation, that would be the local non-targeted effect or bystander effect. Another question, shall the beam delivery have a special time structure? Um, um, 
please please make a little bit more specific. Uh, I am afraid I, I didn't understand the point. Can in, the person who sense, asked this time, question time be a bit more specific? You mean in a sense of the beam on time duration or what? Yes, beam on time duration. I mean, this is unfortunately something that we cannot control. It is like it is, uh, meaning, um, I guess, based on the case, you know, tumor volume and so on, uh, in order to deliver that high dose, uh, we would need something like maybe 10, 15, sometimes maybe 20 minutes, you know, uh, to deliver that dose with the beam set. Yes. So this is something that we cannot control. Uh, it would be perfect uh, or it would perfectly fit with this approach if we could deliver the dose uh, following the, you know, uh, flash technology. So in, in really a uh, uh, very, 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 extremely, very short uh, time frame. But unfortunately, we are not able right now. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Slavisa, for, for your very nice presentation and for answering pleasure. your questions. Thank it you so much. Pleasure. We will now move on to our next presentation from uh, Christian Graf from GSI, who will be giving us an overview of the the pioneering heavy iron therapy at GSI, uh, HIT, and the MIT hospitals. Christian, I give you the floor. Thanks, Nicholas. So this is now a bit different uh, presentation because I'm not a clinician and we also don't treat patients anymore. So first I would like to tell you what, what uh, GSI actually is. So we are actually um, a basic research facility. We operate large uh, accelerators, much larger than than are actually needed for therapy. So here in the front is the GSI complex, uh, and um, it's located in Germany, in Darmstadt. So more or less in the middle of Europe, uh, if you like. And uh, we have a bit more than a thousand um, employees, and uh, most of them are actually scientists and engineers, and we also have a large amount of visiting scientists. And uh, the hallmark of, of GSI is basically that we operate a very complex uh, set of accelerators and storage rings, which um, are very diverse in purpose. So we can accelerate everything from proton to uranium. Uh, so create very, very different kinds of beams, which are used for quite a lot of different experiments. Uh, among them also, um, uh, therapy, biophysics, and space research with these uh, with these energy uh, with these uh, ions. Yeah, and specifically, we also have located around about here, which is uh, on the picture. It's about here. Um, there is Cave M, which is the the site of the uh, pilots project for carbon ion therapy that GSI conducted uh, about ten years ago, or started more than twenty years ago, where the first patients. Uh, in Europe, which you did with carbon ions. But first, uh, a bit more to the future, what you see in the background here is actually the construction site of our next uh, accelerator set. This is the uh, so-called FAIR project, the facility for anti-proton and ion research, um, which will need to a whole host of new accelerators to our ensemble. Um, and it will also uh, lead us, so we will produce now antiprotons to uranium, if you want, minus one, a uh, bit sloppy, whatever. Uh, and very important, we will increase the intensity quite a lot, which is also interesting for biophysics applications, as I will show you uh, in the next slides. And it's, it's also very interesting because of, as Larissa just uh, told you, flash is currently a very important um, development in radiotherapy, and we recently started um, a flash um, research project. Um, and this we can do because we have this very high amount of ions in our accelerators. The energies will also be increased in the accelerator, but this is more interesting for um, for uh, the physics program and not that much for um, the biophysics. Okay, so the research, obviously this accelerator is not functional at the moment, but what we currently do is the so-called FAIR phase zero research uh, program where already some of the, the old systems have new control 
um, software and new detectors installed. And also there was a significant intensity upgrade for the SIS-18, for the existing accelerator. And this uh, enables biophysics research, for example, for flash and also for the use of radioactive ion beams directly for treatment. So this is the new complex of accelerators. Everything that is blue is the existing GSI uh, accelerators and the red ones are the new FAIR accelerators. Just so that you, uh, you see the idea is basically that we have uh, this, this injector, which is a few meters long in the therapy centers here, it's 100 meters. The CIS-18, our synchrotron that we currently have has a circumference of about 200 meters. And the new CIS-100 will be more than one kilometer in, uh, in circumference. And this is an entire chain of accelerators. So the CIS-18 gets the beam from the Unilac and will inject into the CIS-100. And then this will serve the new experiments. I would like to show you a, a, a bit of a movie um, of the current status of the um, of the construction site. So here you see the GSI center in the background. Um, this is the the accelerator as it's being built. You can see that we basically now have a the concrete flooring of the entire ring, um, and some of the ring is already closed again. So all this section here is already closed over with with uh, the soil, um, and here. You can, this is the, the CIS-18 is under this hill, and this is the transfer channel where the beam will be tra transported, sorry, to the CIS-100. And in the Southern construction site, all the experiments are starting to, to be built. Yeah, this is roughly the area where the new um, biophysics facility behind the CIS-100 will be. And these um, buildings that you see here will be very important for, for the operation because this is basically the crossing of all the beams. So where the CIS-18 uh, CIS injection into the CIS-100 will happen and also the extraction of the CIS-100 beam to the experiments will happen in this transfer building. And what you see here in the background is the first bunker that is nearly completed for the so-called CBM experiment. This is the um, compressed baryonic matter experiment, which will study um, extreme states of matter as they, for example, occur in neutron stars. So just one more tour of the, of the ring. Uh, So you can see from roughly here on the ring is already, so this is only the flooring, but this is already the ring, um, the tunnel for the ring itself being completed. Okay, here's the, the CBM experiment. I think I will uh, skip the rest and uh, continue the presentation. So the, the actual point of the presentation, of course, is this GSI pilot project in this context here, where we treated the first carbon ion patients in Europe. Um, and, and what I wanted to show you with the, the previous slides was basically that you have a background that we really do basic physics research. And in, in the 90s, when this started, this was kind of an alien proposal. Yeah, so, so the Gerhard Kraft, the, the man behind all of this proposed to do this clinical pilot study and he was not met with too much love by his colleagues because this was something that they could not simply could not imagine that there would be patients in in this research site yeah. and it took a long time to establish this but in the end it was a successful collaboration between the University Clinic Heidelberg uh, the Forschungszentrum or now Helmholtz Center at Dresden Rossendorf and GSI and finally, 440 patients were treated between 1997 and 2008. Yeah. And uh, mainly uh, what we targeted was radio resistance, low growing head and neck tumors. Uh, about 75 of the patients had either a chordoma or a chondrosarcoma, which you might recognize from the two previous presentations. So it's, it, this is still one of the main applications of carbon ion therapy. And I think it's also one of the few where uh, there's a refunding of the 
of the official bodies, at least in Germany, for for treatment of these two kinds of tumors solely with carbon ion therapy. Again, this was basically the team. So the the boss of the um, radio oncology in University of Heidelberg at this time was uh, Martin Wannmacher, who initiated this together with the, the colleagues uh, with Gerhard Kraft, the, the, the director of the biophysics, and Hans Specht, who was the, the scientific director of the whole of GSI at that point. And they also um, had Wolfgang Enhardt from, from Dresden. Um, and here the, the team, of course, it supported the clinical aspects. So this is actually Jürgen Debus, who is now the He's now the director of the radio oncology and also the clinical director of the Heidelberg IND uh, facility. And at that time, he was the leading clinician for this project. Um, and Dresden, as, as a very important contribution, they provided a positron emission tomography camera that you probably heard about already during this week, that this is uh, possible to monitor the beam because the beam itself creates nuclear reactions and positron emitters when it enters the, the body. And at GSI, this was done for the first time in a clinical scale that, that really for most of the patients that we had in the pilot project, we did these PET camera um, uh, images. And this was extremely important, uh, especially for the first patients that, that people really could image the beam, which is still a bit unusual um, for radiotherapy. So Jürgen Debus uh, once said that they treat an invisible um, target with an invisible knife inside this patient. Yeah? And, and here, this PET image could really show the, the physicians that they more or less hit what they targeted, which was very, very um, uh, good for the, for the confidence in this kind of revolutionary treatment. All of this would not have been possible without Gerhard Kraft. So he's the, the founder and director of the GSI Biophysics. He was the director from 19, 1981 to 2008 until the end of the, the pilot project. And um, he was already in the 70s. He was at GSI and then had a research stay at Berkeley, who were at that time point still treating patients uh, with a variety of ions, yeah, and amongst them also neon ions, very heavy, and also helium and protons, light ions. Um, and, and this inspired him basically to really push for also for uh, an ion therapy project at GSI. So when he returned in 81 and founded the biophysics department, um, he really started to lobby for this. Uh, but it still took like uh, more than a decade um, before this was um, also with a change of, of the GSI scientific director to Hans Specht, who then enabled um, the start of this project in 1993. And you, you kind of have to imagine that at this time point in 1993, there was basically no active um, heavy iron ter therapy center in the world. Berkeley stopped operation. A year later, um, the HIMAX center started, so the Japanese uh, um, Carbon Ion Center started in 1994, uh, and this was really an open field, and, and not much technology was available that was that could directly be used. So, and and I just listed here some of the innovations that were necessary to get this going. For example, at this time point, the accelerator was not able to switch energies from one spill to the next, which is the workhorse for all synchrotron-based um, facilities that are in operation nowadays, uh, and when the therapy started, they were able to support this very large number of combinations of beams. So 250 energies, seven foci, 15 intensities. You can multiply this yourself. It's quite a large number and they could select any of this from one spill to the next with a three second switching time. This was quite an achievement from the accelerator department. Yeah, and then the list goes on. So there's the beam monitoring, um, of course, it's extremely important to have very precise knowledge of the location and of the dose that you deliver, the location of the beam and the dose that you deliver, and the, the ionization chambers and, and um, wire chambers that were designed at this time. They, we still use the very same chambers now today, so basically 30 years after they were built. And especially this, this parallel plate ionization chamber that measures the, the dose is basically still state-of-the-art. 
then I already mentioned this PET, the positron emission tomography, uh, and its importance to to the project. Yeah, so this is something that that um, uh, is still or is regaining um, popularity nowadays. So there's a, a project for this at KNAU. There's a, a long-standing project in Japan, and also we, as I will show you in a few slides, are are looking into this again. Then the beam scanning, of course, I think you saw a lot of videos on, on beam scanning. Uh, the, the KFM facility was basically the first facility where patients were treated with beam scanning, fully active 3D beam scanning as we uh, know it nowadays. And today, basically every particle therapy facility comes with a system that is very similar to what we uh, established in the 90s. Um, also, what it, you heard now that that radiobiological modeling is very important for these ions, yeah? and and it was already clear that um, heavy ions don't have the same effect on tissue as as low LET photons or protons. So it was known that that we need to know a lot about the RBE, and a lot of this data actually comes from the biophysics research um, that was mainly done by Wilma Weirata. Uh, in the run-up to this uh, clinical project. And then also um, this local effect model was developed at GSI by Michael Scholz and his colleagues. Um, and basically the, to, to also partially answer the question that was, that was for two talks ago. So um, at that point in time, the only other center that he did with carbon was, uh, was the Japanese center who used the MKM model, but they used a, a passive delivery team. So they, they did not scan the beam, but they had this passive scattering and then a modulation to deliver the beam. And basically the version of the MKM that they used was incompatible with the scanning approach. So there was not even a choice to use the same model. We, we basically had to develop our own uh, and, and the rest is history basically because then the, the um, both models diverged a bit um, and, and now both have several thousand patients treated uh, and it basically have a, a different history of how to approach uh, therapy. And it's very difficult to reconcile this. You know? So uh, of course, it would be very good to have a common dosing scheme for everybody. But at this point, it's, it's really challenging to come to a, a, a common point of view. And it also has to be said that both models have their strengths and weaknesses. And as um, uh, Piero said, it's it's kind of good to have two models so that you can double check and see what, what the other model would say. Yeah. This goes on. So there's a fragmentation and scattering data. So you need a lot of knowledge about the beam to actually feed the, the radiobiological modeling. And this was measured uh, at GSI quite extensively in the group of Dieter Schad. And we also created basically from scratch uh, our treatment planning software trip, that, which we still use for research purposes now. Uh, and this included for the first time this biological treatment planning that I think you had a lecture uh, yesterday. Uh, and then eventually also a multi field optimization, um, which others uh, also did before, but still not in this context of the, the biological treatment planning. This was the work of Michael Kremer. Um, and basically the result of all of this is the very large uh, still existing GSI biophysics department. We now have about 80 um, people uh, working with us, uh, organized in eight different groups, which covers a very large spectrum from really basic biology to uh, the still ongoing clinical radiobiology where we try to um, validate uh, clinical RBE clinical effects that, that can be observed uh, in, in animals and cells in, in patients uh, to medical physics, which is my group. So really delivery strategies, but also something like stem cells. So we, we are uh, licensed to, to work with human stem cells, uh, which is also kind of a rarity, especially in the, in the radio oncology field. Um, but we also do space radiation. And we still have these groups of Michael Scholz and Michael Kremer who still work on the radiobiological modeling with a LEM and on treatment planning and validation with, with TRIP. So this is really a, a wide spectrum uh, that we deal with. 
So just to, to give you one example of how this could look like, this is this is actual pet images from the pilot project. Yeah, so here uh, you, you have the treatment plan. And from this, you can calculate with Monte Carlo measures, uh, methods um, a predicted beta plus activity, and then also measure this uh, afterwards. And if you compare the two, you can roughly uh, see uh, with the, within the resolution limit of this technology, you can see that the beam uh, uh, stops where you think it should stop. And, and this is very helpful um, if you do this for the first time. And this, of course, is uh, is evolving. So what we do now is pet with radioactive beams uh, in this uh, so-called BARP project, Biomedical Applications of Radioactive Ion Beams, which is funded uh, by the European Research Council uh, for our director, Marco Durante. And the, the reasoning is basically here. You, you can see uh, the, the, the stable 12 carbon beam will give you such a, um, uh, a PET signal after 20 seconds and 20 minutes. And you see that basically a lot of the activity is not where the beam is stopping, but it's before the beam is stopping. And if you use 11 carbon, which has a half-life of 20 minutes, then you actually see activity coincides. So this is already a quite a large advantage. Um, and you can also go one step further and use 10 carbon, which has a half-life of 20 seconds. And then you get also a very fast signal. So now, uh, you see that, that here, this image is basically only dominated by, by the 10 carbon decay, and you get a very clear signal of the dose that you actually deliver. The problem is that this is extremely complex to, to produce these beams. So between the 12 carbon and the 11 carbon um, intensity is roughly four orders of magnitude if you produce it uh, in our fragment separator. Uh, and so this is kind of challenging to produce and to to especially produce at intensities where you can do experiments with this. Um, and this is why we really um, benefit from this fair um, intensity upgrade of our systems. And two weeks ago, we had for the first time uh, an 11 carbon beam in KVM. Uh, and the, the studies are ongoing. The, the ERC just started and will be um, ongoing for the next four years. This is my own research. I, I would like to just show you two movies. What we try to do is uh, we try to irradiate a straight line. This is just for present uh, for for demonstration purposes. So what we actually want to do is we want to irradiate a straight line like this on the film. And unfortunately, the film is moving. So this is a the the patient example for this would be um, a, a breathing patient with a lung tumor where you try to hit the tumor, but what happens if the tumor is moving that you see this kind of interplay effects. Yeah? So this is now just an uncompensated delivery of the straight line. So the scanner, the, the only thing that the scanner is doing is to deliver this one straight line downwards or, or upwards. And as the, the film is moving while the beam is delivered, you see these strange wiggly patterns, which is absolutely not what you would like to deliver. And what we are working on is basically on uh, strategies to compensate this. Yeah. So what you see here in this line coming up here is um, with the same motion amplitude, um, a fully compensated delivery. So basically you end up with a straight line by um, delivering motion synchronized and also uh, uh, with, uh, yeah, so it's a fairly complex scheme, but in the end we, we synchronize the delivery to the motion and we also have a, um, an additional beam tracking uh, inside. And this is basically also two weeks old data, so very new. And of course, this, this application is very simple, but this also works for uh, very complex treatment uh, fields, which you could in principle apply to a patient once we get this robust and safe. Yeah, so in the end, you can see that, that basically there's no difference between the line delivered to the moving film and the line delivered to the static film. Yeah, which, so this is the, the static line as it was intended to be. To come back to the, or basically this is uh, just as a future outlook, what we'd like to do with KVM. So we, we have an, an hardware upgrade that is underway. Um, we've already switched from the old 
pilot project hardware that was is now 30 years old and was no longer usable, we switched to the cloud dose delivery system. We are still updating our nozzle detectors for greater delivery speed and for increased dynamic range, especially of the position detectors. And the idea is that this will be uh, at some point a test bed facility with uh, a very flexible and very potent accelerator behind it, which can give you very, very different um, dose qualities and, and um, intensities, uh, but still has these close to clinic irradiation conditions. So we still have uh, the, the full scanning capability and the state of the art nozzle detectors to deliver high quality uh, doses as you similar to as you would do it in the patient uh, in the patient treatment but we don't have these clinical constraints so we can play around with everything and if it breaks then we don't have to worry that uh, in the next morning there will be a patient on the table and it should better work we can really uh, do high risk high gain stuff yeah and we also work on on uh, including more imaging capability to our cave so we will get a small animal micro ct very soon we are in the process of acquiring um, and, uh, and <laughs> extra thanks for the amazing <laughs> comment. Um, a photon animal irradiator uh, and also a cone beam CT, which we can use for positioning stuff uh, at our ISIS center at the beam target. And then under construction uh, is the bar pet detector which will have a much smaller volume than the original PET detector, but also will be much more efficient uh, and have a much higher resolution and which we will have in full use roughly in 2023. So now coming back to, to the clinical part uh, of the pilot project, um, basically this, this was the- concluding, Chris. Okay. I'm hurrying up. So this is basically um, the outcomes for the chondrosarcoma and the chordoma. And as you heard in the previous talks, uh, carbon iron therapy is very successful for this. Um, and these outcomes basically led to uh, the building of the uh, Heidelberg iron therapy facility. Yeah, and this actually the, the proposal for this was already submitted a few months after the first patient was treated in 1998. And this was eventually also approved and the construction started in 2003. And the first patient was treated in the year after our pilot project ended. Yeah. And this, this was constructed together with uh, Siemens Medical. <clears throat> um, and the, the HIT accelerator was actually a joint effort of GSI and Siemens. And Siemens then proceeded on to build three more accelerators uh, mostly on their own, still using our designs and, and basically a variant of the HIT um, uh, accelerator. But this was done without basically GSI, direct GSI input. But unfortunately, Siemens then quit the field in 2011. Uh, and this led to a, this very unfortunate event that the keel, the existing keel accelerator, which was basically already uh, operating under beam, that was scrapped, but um, MIT and Shanghai are in operation. So for the sake of time, I will speed up substantially. You may have seen an, an image of the Heidelberg facility. Um, this is the synchrotron. These are two fixed beam lines that are actually pretty similar to, to what we had at GSI. And this is the very first uh, carbon ion gent gantry um, that was ever built. Uh, a fun fact is that this entire facility fits inside the, the smaller of, this, of the GSI synchrotrons. Yeah, so they treated by now around uh, 6,000 patients, probably now it's 7,000, but the, the newest data that I got is from the end of 2019. This is just a picture of, of the gantry here, just to see the scale of this massive structure. And this is one of the fixed beam uh, lines uh, with a, um, a patient lying on the tail. You can see that, of course, everything is a lot more modern than uh, what we have in GSI, but in principle, all the components are uh, more or less the same. They now also, I think they installed now um, in-room 3D imaging, which is really uh, a step further uh, than what we had at, at GSI. And of course, the machine is working by now a lot faster than GSI was. This is the, the carbon ion center map 
uh, of the world, basically, as they are now operating. The, the bold ones are the basically follow-ups of GSI, and these three centers treated more than 9,000 patients at the end of 2019. And with that, I would like to thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Chris, for your presentation. Very interesting um, uh, to, to know the historical context of heavy iron therapy in Europe. We now will see a few questions. Maybe we don't take all of them because we are a bit late. So if th this, is the, this is the million dollar, excuse the billion dollar question when we will finish there, probably it's something like 2026. Um, the, so it's hard to produce C10 because the cross section is very small. Yeah, so you, it, the way we do this is in the fragment separator. So you put a target into the beam and then you create a lot of fragments and you separate out the ones um, that you want to have with a set of very large dipole magnets. Yeah, and the intensity that we aim for for now is uh, about 10 to the seven per second for carbon 11 and probably something like 10 to the six for carbon 10. And, and with this scheme, you will not get this into the clinic. Yeah, so this, the bar project is really um, to see if it's worth the effort and a clinical facility would use uh, a low energy scheme to create the isotopes and then the isotope itself is accelerated. So it's not an in-flight production, but you use an ESOL technique as it's, for example, used at CERN to first create the isotope and then accelerate this. Uh, the motion compensation is in that sense, similar to gating uh, that we gate, but we gate 10 times. So we basically, we never shut off the beam, but we switch treatment plans for each of uh, continuous 10 gating windows. And the delivery time is roughly 20% longer in a full treatment plan. Nicholas, you stop me if I should. Uh, I think we're going to continue this one. Right? Um, so basically, what we do is, is really we have 10 treatment plans for 10 motion phases. And when we detect a phase change in the patient, we also change the motion plan. So the, the, the plan that we, so we prepare a whole library of plans and we aim to deliver all of them. And the big advantage is that we take in, in everything that we know about the patient movement before we actually start the treatment from imaging, from wherever we try to already put into the treatment plan, which allows us to change the ranges so if you have to imagine that if the tumor is moving in the patient, of course, this motion also changes the range to the tumor, which is really crucial for, for the carbon ion therapy. Yeah? And if you manage to put this already in the treatment plan, then you can be much more conformal than if you try to react afterwards to something that you see, yeah? because it's hard to change the range online. And together with this tracking update that we have now since basically two weeks or so, it also works for non-periodic motion, at least to some extent. So it, it helps if you, if the patient breathes somewhat regular and it's okay if you have a drift, uh, like a slow drift. If of course, if the patient is coughing and breathing completely irregular, then, then it's, it's very difficult. Uh, and for the last question, you probably have to ask somebody from HIT. As far as I know, they, they pretty much have a Schwarze Null. So basically they, they cover the costs, yeah. But this uh, is, HIT was basically built from, uh, with a large part of, of public support. So they, I, I imagine that a commercial center has higher capital cost. Thank you so much, Christian, for your uh, lovely presentation and also for answering these questions. Um, we will now move on to our next speaker. It is a pleasure for me to invite Manuela Cirilli and Benjamin Frisch from CERN, who will give us a presentation on the fun, uh, from fundamental research to medical applications. Manuela you. and Benjamin, you've got the floor. Thank you, Nicolas. A pleasure to see you and a lot of other colleagues again. Uh, Benjamin actually was uh, standing by in case I got my second shot of the vaccine a couple of hours ago, so he didn't make it back uh, home on time by me. So giving the presentation and thank you very much, um, Christian, for uh, introducing already 
the topic of uh, larger uh, research infrastructure, because I'm bringing you on uh, also a slightly different path even than uh, what Christian showed you for uh, uh, GSI, because uh, uh, CERN, the laboratory where I work, uh, is uh, yet another different beast, if you want, in the category of uh, uh, research institutes. Um, I do believe you see my slides, but in case I shout um, if there's a problem. Um, so CERN is a, a laboratory. It lies at the border between France and Switzerland. And uh, we, it was founded in 1954. And the, the, the story of the foundation of CERN will deserve uh, a full uh, talk, if you want. But the important uh, component here is that it is built as a laboratory meant to foster peace and collaboration between uh, different uh, people through science. And uh, but science gets really big at CERN. This is an aerial view and what you see in yellow marked is actually underground at 100 meters on average. And is the 27 kilometer ring of the Large Hadron Collider. It's our latest flagship accelerator. In this accelerator, protons are accelerated to 13 tera electron volt, and they collide in four points where uh, we have uh, particle detectors built around these uh, collision points to detect uh, the, uh, the particles emerging from the collision. So the LHC is just the last of a huge chain of accelerators that you see in blue, the super proton synchrotron, and actually on the CERN campus that lies here in this triangle. On your right, there are uh, a lot of other accelerators. Some of them are feeding into the LHC. Some are used for uh, fixed target uh, projects. Uh, our mission is uh, basic research, is understanding the origin of the universe and how, uh, let's see, how the universe came to be as it is uh, today. Uh, this mission of basic research, uh, we uh, articulated over four uh, different pillars. One is, of course, knowledge and uh, pushing back the frontiers of knowledge, uh, training of scientists and engineers. We are not uh, a university, but there are uh, thousands of doctoral students every year doing their PhD thesis uh, at CERN on CERN experiments or, or on the CERN accelerators. Uh, this mission of uniting people from different countries and culture, and of course, the development of new technologies. Uh, the technologies that we need for our scientific ambitions can rarely be found off the shelf. Uh, you normally have to develop yourselves. And uh, the three main uh, pillars of technologies are, of course, accelerators, detectors, why here you see the scale of the atom detector in construction, uh, and uh, of course, large computing infrastructure as well. Uh, for us, uh, medical applications they come into play in uh, uh, what we call uh, knowledge transfer. Um, sorry, I'm trying to see the, the chat. Um, what we call knowledge transfer, meaning uh, transferring the know-how and the technologies developed at CERN for our core program to society and to other fields of society. Um, what you see on the on the right is a list of applications that are already existing today. It's not our bucket list. Our ambitions are much bigger than that. Uh, but these are activities that are already well started uh, and where we have several cases of applications. Uh, and uh, concerning medical uh, uh, technologies, uh, well, this is an exercise that dates back to the 70s. Uh, what you see in the picture was this is probably from the middle of the 80s. Uh, on the left, you see George Chartak, and behind uh, the detector, you see Fabio Sauli playing uh, with uh, one of the multi wire proportional chambers uh, or one of the uh, offspring uh, from Chartak. So Chartak in 1968, uh, while at CERN, invented uh, this detector, the multi wire proportional, proportional chamber, uh, and he got the Nobel Prize afterwards for it. Uh, and uh, this chamber was used and is still used in medical imaging today. It was uh, the first detector that was capable of recording millions of particle tracks uh, per second. And in medical imaging, the sensitivity of this detector uh, was crucial to lower, for example, the exposure of the patients to, uh, during X-ray procedures. 
And uh, by the way, since I know that some of you uh, attended one of the social events earlier this week with one of my colleagues uh, uh, discussing about entrepreneurship, CHOP was also uh, one of the very first examples of researchers and entrepreneurs. I went on to found companies to apply his detectors in particular in radiology. Um, same images from the end of the 70s, uh, what you see on the right, uh, and uh, it's probably compared to what we have in the technology, uh, it looks really outdated, uh, is the first uh, PET imaging, image of a mouse uh, done at CERN uh, with the equipment that you see on the left, or on the left, you, you see the, the detector, and you see the, the little mouse here, and all the electronics. Uh, and so this was done with the HIDAC, which was an offspring of the multi-wire proportional chamber by David Towns and Alan Jevons, who lately went, who later went on to use this technology with uh, the Cantonal Hospital in Geneva. And then David Townsend uh, was one of the fathers of combined PET CT afterwards. 2018, quite a change if you want uh, in uh, images and resolution. This is the first 3D color X-ray of a human. Uh, this is of course a human lens. It's a machine that uh, is for uh, X-ray uh, extremities using a technology developed at CERN called Meditix. This is a uh, so-called hybrid pixel detector technology and is capable of taking uh, images in color. And not only it can be used, and here we are closer to uh, carbon therapy, um, ways it's been used already to take inline images of different uh, therapeutic beings uh, to see whether uh, the detector can be used, uh, in particular in uh, carbon uh, and ion therapy facilities uh, for beam monitoring purposes. The involvement of CERN in adult therapy dates back to the 90s. Uh, I'm sure you heard a part of this uh, in the talk from uh, Maurizio Bretenar uh, earlier in the week. Uh, so I tried uh, to limit the overlap of Maurizio's talk and give you a bit more uh, information. Uh, so in the 90s, uh, CERN hosted uh, this uh, study uh, together with the Dosna Oncology 2000 and Terra Foundation, uh, which it was called the PIMS, the Program Ion Medical Machine Study, and this was uh, the foundation of the Terra and NFN, the Cloud uh, Foundation Accelerator and uh, of the Medostron Accelerator. And we still collaborate with both uh, Cloud and uh, Medostron uh, for uh, uh, their existing facilities. The NIMS, the next IO Medical Machine Study, is what is happening now, 20 years after PIMS. You heard about it from Maurizio, so I won't go in the detail of what he presented, but just remind you that uh, the idea behind NIMS is to focus the effort on core technologies of CERN and their use in ion therapy. Uh, and we have four major work packages on which we are working. I'm going to show you something that uh, was not in Maurizio's slides, so you have it complementary, and is a bit about uh, the Carbon 6 plus LINAC option for uh, ion therapy. So this is a work that is ongoing in collaboration with CMAT uh, in Spain. And uh, what the challenges are for uh, this uh, LINAC option uh, are uh, in particular for uh, the sources, the whole train free injector, and of course, have to have a hospital friendly footprint. The work that has been done at CERN so far concerns uh, the electron beam ion source. We have a prototype that's been built and is being tested at CERN. Uh, the RF accelerated structure, uh, the radio frequency quadrupole, which is uh, based on the proton RFU design that was done in 2015 and that is now licensed to. Uh, uh, Avo and uh, your Adam that is uh, uh, testing uh, their own uh, LINAC system for proton therapy in uh, Desbury and the STFC facilities. The, what you see here, I'm not going to tell you that this is the full accelerator course. This is 50 centimeters, it's one module of the radio frequency cavity, which gets with four modules on two meters. And basically goes up from 40 kilo, uh, volts to 5 mega volts of energy for uh, the incoming uh, particles and protons. Um, when it comes uh, to having a hospital friendly footprint, uh, what uh, we've been working on at the moment is this idea of a bent 
uh, Lina because of that uh, one could be fitted or folded, uh, as you could call it, so you could fit more easily into hospitals. You see in Maurizio's presentation, we've been uh, working also on uh, uh, a superconducting ion gantry rotating uh, based, based on an idea from uh, an initial concept from uh, uh, Terra to basically attach the gantry uh, to the wall in order, in order to remove the counterweight. But we're also exploring a totally different and innovative concept that is based on um, uh, superconducting uh, toroidal magnet. And uh, what you see here is the original sketch from uh, the inventor, um, Luca Bottura from CERN, where his idea was uh, how to focus uh, basically all beams on the patient location with a fixed toroidal field. And there was on the side how it works, uh, each of the coil, uh, in the section of each of the coils, the beams of different energies, depending on the impinging angle, will be focused on the patient location uh, and for every given energy. And of course, uh, this allows a fast energy uh, switching. Uh, and by the way, for those of you who are interested, there is a very, very recent, uh, from a couple of months ago, article from the Chinese who are proposing uh, a, um, a totally a very similar uh, scheme for a proton therapy flash in the NAC facility, uh, where they have something similar to the ateroid, uh, but with this diff different coil configurations. And here you see various uh, simulations of gatoroid for protons, ions, uh, going to, depending on how much flexibility you want on the number of incoming angles on the patient, and you can go from quite compact gantries for ions to much larger ones. And now, before you become excited, uh, I think that this idea is very ex exciting. It is also a, a very forward-looking idea because it will require a lot of work also in terms of uh, how to fit the typical uh, clinical uh, equipment uh, that you normally find in the room. Um, at Slurma, we we also been working on dosimetry for uh, hypnotherapy, in particular for uh, Q&A, and using the detector called GEM, I meant GEMPIX. So the GEM are a gas uh, ionization detector developed at Slurma. MediPix is the chip that I mentioned when I showed you the picture uh, of X-rays in colors. And the combination of the two is this a package you see on the left. And uh, it gives you a detector as a heavy device that is capable of detecting all types of radiation with very high spatial resolution. And it was tested at, in the Knau ion beam. And there you see, you see the reconstruction in 3D on the, uh, the beam, the black peak, the fragmentation plane. Uh, this test uh, highlighted the need for uh, much larger areas detector uh, for uh, uh, use uh, in adult therapy. And so an activity that is going on at the moment uh, is uh, to develop uh, such a detector uh, with also an innovative optical readout, which you see here as the first uh, measurements and images and the plans uh, for 2021, uh, if the situation allows it, uh, is uh, to test uh, uh, this system at now again in a water fountain setup. Um, I know Maurizio uh, again mentioned that flash very uh, energy electron therapy when uh, uh, he spoke about medical accelerators, and this is something on which we are working uh, with several partners, but in particular with uh, uh, the Lausanne University Hospital, La Shuv to develop a machine that is based on the technology developed for CLIC. CLIC is a study yet for a possible future accelerator uh, far beyond uh, the larger Hadron Collider. And the technology of CLIC is really uh, suited for the needs of very high energy electron therapy plus flash. Uh, because uh, the, the quick technology will really born to provide very intense electron beams, uh, very precisely controlled, uh, and of course, a high accelerating radiance because this allows a compactness of the facility. Um, and all of this work it brings also to talk about facilities at CERN. Uh, this collaboration, for example, with Shuva started because. Uh, um, Various research groups have started coming to CERN to use the beams at the Clear facility that provides uh, electron beams of 200 MV. 
uh, with characteristics that are difficult to find elsewhere and that are uh, extremely useful to test at very high end of electron therapy and different types of uh, um, And so there have been, uh, since Asamiasa, quite a number of uh, uh, activities uh, in clear. Uh, where you can see on the right a few the most recent publications that cover a lot of different uh, subjects and topics uh, from uh, very different uh, groups. And in terms of facilities, uh, this is uh, the last uh, topic that I uh, wanted to cover in this uh, quick overview of what we are doing at the moment in medical applications. It is called uh, Medicis. So Medicis is an entirely different type of facility, but it's still uh, linked to cancer treatment in a different way. Um, it's through the production of what are called the non-conventional isotopes. Um, meaning uh, isotopes at, at the moment cannot be produced uh, uh, industrially. Uh, they are not yet studied in detail and it could be interesting for medical research because uh, uh, nuclear medicine is fueled uh, really by new isotopes that can satisfy the needs of the, um, of the researcher for speci each specific application if you want. The medicine is based on uh, an accelerator, uh, a facility that's been uh, operating at CERN for more than 50 years. It's called ISOLD. Uh, the picture on the left shows you what I was uh, mentioned earlier is uh, the complex chain of accelerators at CERN. And this is not to scale uh, because this is 27 kilometers and the SPS is seven. So otherwise, uh, the LC will be out of the picture. And you see in green uh, here, ISOLD takes the proton beam from the PS booster. Uh, the beam goes on a target and then uh, produces uh, radioisotopes that are separated by mass separation. What we've been doing uh, since end of 2017 has been setting up a facility and a full lab dedicated uh, to medical radioisotopes. Uh, Isol can also produce uh, these uh, radioisotopes uh, and uh, has been doing so uh, for a long time, but not, let's say, on a regular basis because uh, there's a whole uh, uh, program of um, research there that covers a lot of topics. And Medicis is basically uh, working transparently to resolve. So when you send the protons on the target, uh, um, not all the protons are interacting. So part of the beam goes to the target. You put a second target behind that, then you bring the target uh, to a system, to the medicines laboratory, where there's another mass separation device that separates the isotopes and then you collect the isotopes and you ship them to the collaborating uh, partners. Um, this is the current collaboration around the medicines. Uh, during the past two years, the CERN has been shut down. Uh, mode. This is something called the LS2, long shutdown 2, where now the accelerators are waking up after this period. The medicines, was able to run through uh, sources that were irradiated at other labs and then brought to CERN where you can use uh, the mass separation equipment uh, to separate the isotopes. And then the purification happens uh, in uh, collaborating institutes. And here you see, for example, what was done uh, last year in terms of radionuclides that were uh, collected at Medicis. And the studies done in Medicis are already uh, allowed to pinpoint, uh, to produce uh, some uh, isotopes, uh, for example, there are some isotopes of ergium, to new purity grades. Uh, this means uh, that these isotopes that uh, uh, were used for niche applications uh, with higher purity, they can become more interesting uh, for uh, other treatments uh, and other applications in the medical field. Um, that is it, uh, in the sense, if you want me, I can go on uh, for uh, two hours uh, talking about the rest of the application that CERN, but I thought of limiting myself uh, to what is, uh, uh, let's say, uh, closer to hormone therapy. And before I take questions, a disclaimer, although I'm a practical physicist, uh, you know, my job at the moment is accompanying the technologies uh, to find the user. So I try to answer all your technical questions, uh, but for those that I cannot answer, I'll send you links, uh, I'll send you everything and be happy to connect you with uh, the people who are actually behind what I presented uh, because I'm really just a presenter today and I'm not behind any of these projects. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Manuela, for your very interesting presentation.
Uh, we have some time for questions. We are running actually, late, but actually, will... there are no questions. It there are no questions. Presentation, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we can but move on. Um, copy and email if you have questions. <laughs> yes, uh, you are all invited to drop an email to Manuela Chirilli um, uh, from CERN, um, either to her email address or directly to the knowledge transfer office. If you have any questions, they will be very pleased to support you. Um, we are rather late, but we will splash over into the coffee break a little bit. Um, it is now my pleasure to invite Marco Puglia again from CNAU um, to give us an overview of CNAU's accelerator complex and upgrade plans. Mario, Marco, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Ah, there you are. I can share my screen. Can you see the Yes, you can see it and, and we can hear you loud and clear. Very good. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Uh, today I, I will give you a bird's eye view of, uh, let's say, the research activities uh, uh, of now, some of them, uh, they, they are too many to enter into, to enter into the details of uh, all of them. So it will be a very superficial uh, view of what we do. Uh, now, of course, you know, because we treat patients, but besides the clinical activity, now as, as an institutional purpose, also research. Of course, research that you can do uh, with our machine and uh, that is uh, somehow related or useful uh, for us, but uh, it, it can vary from technical to preclinical and transnational uh, subjects. And generally, the aim is to try and improve uh, uh, the treatment somehow, or, or in the end, uh, we try to use it at best in this direction, either because uh, you try to understand better the biological mechanisms underlying uh, the, the treatment and uh, the planning and so on, such that you can uh, make a, a better plan and a better treatment, or because you improve the physical knowledge, like uh, measurement of the cross-section and fragmentation cross-section that will allow you to make a better uh, simulation of what happens uh, and make a better treatment plan as well, or uh, improving the technical performance of the accelerator, uh, like trying to have uh, uh, higher intensities or uh, faster acceleration or uh, something like this, uh, improving the dose delivery or uh, uh, we will see providing new types of radiation, which are new weapons to the clinician. All of this we do not do alone, of course. Uh, we, we need and we have uh, many pleasure, uh, many pleasant uh, collaborations with many institutions uh, which are fundamental for, uh, for our research. Well, the now Accelerator, uh, we have already seen on Tuesday, but uh, just to give a quick look, it's a uh, a small synchrotron of the PIMS family, 25 meters in diameter. It accelerates protons and carbon, and we have three treatment rooms uh, with the horizontal beam lines, and in one of the three treatment rooms, we also have a vertical beam line. And besides the treatment rooms, we also have an experimental room, a room dedicated to just experimental activities. And uh, uh, in order to make the best possible Uh, uh, setups uh, so you can have uh, uh, the largest uh, radiation field or the longest uh, throw behind your target uh, depending on the type of experiment that you want to do and uh, it's an important asset because it allows uh, accessing uh, the room during uh, the day during treatments the, the beam you can have only during nights and weekends because during uh, normal days we have treatment and the beam is dedicated to treatment but you can leave it in there for a few days if you need to have a longer acquisition uh, or if you have a complex uh, instrument and uh, besides uh, the experimental room where you can do Uh, also a biological laboratory with the necessary equipment uh, for uh, cell sample process. 
is also possible uh, by taking, a, let's say, discussing and uh, making an agreement with the University of Pavia, which has a small animal house uh, nearby. And uh, here is written, DDS customization is possible. Uh, uh, the, in the experimental room, we have uh, a dose delivery system, which is identical to the one used in the treatment rooms. Uh, but uh, since uh, we do not treat patients with this, we have uh, some more freedom to do modifications and experiments on this. This is how it looks uh, in real life. You can see that uh, it's a modular uh, composition. We have uh, two of these uh, beam lines uh, on wheels that you can install or remove. Also the scanning magnets can be removed from the beam path. And so you can have a longer throw after the target or the largest possible irradiation field if you place your experiment further away from the scanning magnets. And this one is of course open to external users for experiments if they are interested. The types of beam that you can have are more or less the same beams that you have in the treatment rooms. That is photons and carbon in the clinical energy range with up to high in the, the same uh, clinical intensities, but uh, uh, it's possible uh, uh, in some cases when it's needed also to go very low in intensity. And this sometimes is useful for monitor calibration when you want to look at uh, what a single particle does in your monitor, in your experiment, uh, and this is uh, possible. As I said, it's uh, a configurable uh, uh, setup. Okay, well, uh, of course, there are uh, uh, upgrades on the accelerator. I've already anticipated on Tuesday that one of the activities that we, are on, that we have ongoing is, uh, let's say, going towards multi-energy extraction. This will uh, improve the treatment because it will save time, basically. It will make a better use of the beam that we have. Uh, and to do this, we are implementing a ref knockout. And there are other uh, R&Ds in the machine, but uh, this is the, the main one, let's say. And then we have uh, another important, uh, interesting uh, subject is the one of range verification. We have already heard about uh, uh, PET or online PET, as uh, Christian already mentioned. Uh, they were uh, the first one to, to do it, but we have uh, a clinical uh, trial ongoing at now on this with the inside monitor, which has uh, uh, two PET uh, detectors uh, and the prompt uh, particles uh, tracker, tracer. So this allows monitoring uh, where the beam ends because uh, you can monitor where you produce, uh, uh, let's say, PET isotopes, which is not necessarily where the beam ends, as we heard, and uh, uh, because of nuclear interactions between the beam and the body of the patient, uh, you can also have uh, charged particles, neutrons, and uh, prompt uh, uh, photons. And uh, here you see the two PET heads monitoring the PET uh, activation of the patient and uh, the particle tracker that measures the, basically the prompt protons which are produced uh, during the beam. Uh, with protons, you have a larger PET signal because you have a larger number of particles. And with carbon ions, you have more uh, uh, charged, uh, let's say, prompt particles. And as I already anticipated, we have a clinical trial ongoing. Uh, and during this clinical trial, we will uh, test uh, 10 patients with carbon ions and 10 patients with protons of 2020. And uh, <clears throat> the basic idea is to check the repeatability of the PET signal of the measurement that you get in order to check that the patient didn't change. Or if you have a difference in the range of the particles or in the distribution of the activation of the prompt particles, then it might uh, uh, suggest that uh, a, a check, a, a verification CT should be made uh, and uh, possibly uh, the patient can be replanned. Uh, so this is, uh, you see here, uh, uh, along the treatment, uh, how the activity evolves uh, 
at the second fraction or at the 20th uh, fraction of this patient. And then well, this is uh, more uh, my toy if you want. This is uh, uh, probably not uh, really feasible right now, but it's interesting in itself. It's something, uh, uh, also this, uh, th there is a, uh, let's say a, a similar uh, thing uh, ongoing at GSI and at, uh, in Heidelberg, but in principle, you can accelerate uh, in a synchrotron at the same time, helium and carbon, and you can use the carbon to do the treatment. And the helium has a three times larger range and it can escape out of the patient. And it can be used to monitor if the patient is uh, uh, always the same, let's say. And uh, well, it depends on how you prepare your mix of uh, carbon and helium, but uh, let's say in this case, uh, you had only 1% of the dose, uh, which is a, not really a problem. We don't have uh, uh, really uh, the possibility to do it now, but we simulated it with carbon and uh, protons, uh, summing uh, digitally the images, uh, and uh, we demonstrated that you can uh, resolve, uh, let's say, the helium on top of the carbon fragments, and that the system has uh, a resolution which is, uh, let's say, probably be better than one millimeter, but okay. Uh, another thing uh, that is being implemented in town is uh, that we are adding a third source uh, to our synchrotron in order to add uh, new ions, in particular helium, lithium, and oxygen that possibly will be used also in therapy, in clinical, and uh, we will add also iron for uh, uh, experiments or uh, detector development plus a number of other improvements of the machine in order to make it more efficient. And this is the source that we are uh, building. Well, this is the Aisha at uh, uh, Catania, but we are building, a, a, let's say, the evolution of this. And then uh, we have already seen in uh, Christian uh, presentation, we are working together, collaborating with uh, Christian and GSI on the uh, let's say 4D treatment uh, as uh, Christian already anticipated, the treatment is subdivided in 10 phases, which are uh, delivered to the patient according to the uh, respiratory phase. And this saves time with respect to simple gating. And uh, we have already seen much better in Christian presentation. And of course there is the radiobiology where many mechanisms are of interest, uh, radio resistant, uh, uh, high tissue and microenvironment response, uh, effect of uh, high let in combination with other therapeutic modalities. Uh, we have already heard of many of these, uh, uh, and that's not my cup of coffee, but the radiobiology is an important point uh, as well. And uh, uh, going uh, bigger, let's say, it is, uh, up to now it was uh, uh, smaller uh, items being added to the machine. We have plans to expand our center in the short future. And we are uh, acquiring, uh, buying uh, a single room facility from Itachi to have a proton gantry because as I told you, told you we have uh, only uh, fixed beam lines right now. And uh, nowadays a gantry is uh, necessary. Otherwise you are underperforming with your uh, treatment. And we are also adding uh, another uh, uh, facility for accelerator-based boron neutron capture therapy, which is uh, made uh, with an agreement with the uh, Thai TLS. Uh, so we, we will add a new building and uh, uh, increase, uh, make larger the, the present building. And we will insert uh, the Itachi small synchrotron for protons and uh, this is how the Itachi gantry looks like from inside. And uh, for BNCT, we will uh, get from Thai a tandem accelerator, uh, low energy but high current. And then this uh, proton beam is sent onto a, uh, li onto a lithium uh, converter, a lithium target. And then the neutrons coming out of this uh, 
are uh, shaped uh, with what is called the beam shaping gas and the UI to uh, cool down the neutrons and try to direct them towards the patient, which is done in a passive way. And uh, the concept of boron neutron capture therapy is that the neutrons, which are now, uh, let's say, prepared by the BSA and sent toward the patient, uh, can interact uh, with uh, some chemical which uh, somehow we have managed to accumulate into the tumor. This is, uh, the, let's say, the uh, pharmaceutical part uh, on which I have no idea how to, to do it, but uh, of course, uh, pharmacists know how to do it. So you can accumulate uh, a boron compound, uh, a boron agent into the tumor cells. And if you manage to accumulate sufficient uh, boron into the cell, into the tumor without accumulating boron into the healthy tissue around, then when you irradiate with neutrons your patient, your uh, target, because of the large capture cross-section of the boron 10, which then decays uh, in a alpha particle plus lithium with small range below 10 microns, this means that these two high LET ions have a short range and they will remain within the cell. So they are selectively killing the tumor cells, also if they are small. If you don't see them in your CT, if you have small metastases or if your tumor is infiltrated, this methodology may allow you to kill the tumor cells without harming the healthy tissue. And after this, these two are already being built. So this is uh, for sure, and it's already funded and is being uh, built now. And uh, uh, I am short of time. We are also uh, setting up uh, a collaboration with uh, CERN, INFN and Megostron to design and uh, uh, build a carbon ion gantry to be installed at now. Let's say the design should last uh, three or four years. And I would like to see this uh, gantry installed at now within eight, 10 years. It's based on the gantry that Manuela has already shown uh, proposed by Amaldi. We considered at the beginning also the gatoroid, but in the end we decided to go towards uh, a, let's say normal superconducting. Well, normally in carbon ion gantries is not, it doesn't mean, mean much because there are only two gantries worldwide operating. The third one is coming, but is a still small number. So the normal doesn't mean very much, but let's say a normal shape gantry like this one uh, instead of the gatoroid. I couldn't go through all of the possible fields of development because uh, of course the time is short, but uh, the message is that research is a must. When you spend uh, 150 millions for a machine, you don't want it to be older in a short time. And so you must try and keep it young by making it evolve. Uh, an hadron therapy center should not be a black box producing beam. It should be something that uh, can evolve, can grow with time and stay up to date. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Marco, for that very interesting presentation. Um, let's see if we have any questions. There is one question, yes. Um, Marco, yeah. <laughs> Why is the new proton gantry not uh, inserted in one of the existing beam lines? Well, uh, first of all, because uh, uh, you don't want to stop the machine while uh, building the new gantry. Building such a thing would stop the machine for a long time, which is not acceptable when you're patient. Moreover, uh, in this way, we will have two machines. If one of them uh, is, uh, is not working, uh, I don't say that you have a backup on the other one, but at least it will help uh, finishing the most urgent patients or uh, trying to help uh, uh, with the patients when you have a, a problem on the other machine. So it's, uh, it's also a backup. So it's, uh, there are two reasons uh, for it. So the new source of helium, lithium and oxygen ions do you plan to carry out in vitro or in vivo experiments in the future? Certainly both. I would expect both. We will certainly start with in vitro. 
Well, we will start with in silico, <laughs> of course, at the beginning before treating cells. And then we will start with in vitro. I expect, uh, let's say, the Italian uh, authorities to ask uh, now also to do some uh, in vivo experiments uh, like we had uh, to qualify now for carbon at the beginning. And it sounds also reasonable to me. Is the contribution of nitrogen dose, first neutron dose and gamma dose in BNCT not that significant? Do you get more dose to the normal tissue because of this than you would expect in phototherapy? Well, uh, this is uh, uh, certainly a, a complicated question. I don't, I don't know uh, an exact response, but uh, for sure, uh, uh, you will give some dose to normal tissue, but because of the uh, larger uh, cross-section for capture of BNCT, the ratio between the two will be large, or at least this is uh, the idea in order for BNCT to be useful. So depending on the ratio of, uh, uh, let's say, bone carrier that you manage to accumulate, in the tumor and in the normal tissue, you, you can reduce the dose to the normal tissue and to the other organs because of direct neutron irradiation. Are you using BPA? Uh, well, for the moment, uh, it's only on the paper, so we are using nothing. Uh, I think we will use, uh, uh, let's say, the, uh, there is only one uh, compound, which I think is BPA, which has been uh, clinically accepted uh, in Japan, one uh, pharmaceutical uh, thing. And uh, uh, there are only three uh, proposed uh, uh, pharmaceuticals to carry uh, the boron into the tumor. And uh, I think uh, that we will uh, probably uh, use BPA for most of the patients, but I would expect uh, that we test all of them, at least in vitro. In the NCT, how do we deal with lithium and alpha particles from neutron? Well, these are uh, the projectiles. This is what you want, uh, what you use to kill the tumor cells. Let's say that the lithium and alpha particles from neutron capture process are the two bullets that kill the tumor cell. So this is, you, you do nothing with it. They stop within the cell because of the red, which is uh, below 10 microns. And uh, th this is the, the aim of the procedure. Is it possible to combine proton heavy ion therapy with the NCT that's using neutrons produced in patient body uh, well, the, the number of neutrons produced in the patient body during prototherapy of BNCT is far too small for BNCT to work. The, there is, a, a, let's say, a proposal. There are experiments uh, already done uh, in many places around the world, including now, for direct interaction proton boron capture therapy, if you want, if you manage to accumulate uh, but in this case, I think you want uh, uh, boron 11 instead of boron 12. Oh, sorry, or boron 10. Uh, then you have a, cross a good cross section for interaction with protons, and it breaks uh, uh, in three alpha particles, I think. And uh, so we need to start concluding. Yes. Uh, Marco. Basically, you try to add uh, some uh, additional uh, boost to your proton therapy, but uh, the, let's say the, the amount, the increase in efficacy is, uh, is not that large. It's, it's not the NCT in which all of the uh, effect from, comes from that. Marco, thank you so much for your presentation, for answering these questions. Um, very interesting to know um, uh, all these details coming from CNAU. And if there's any student who would like to know more about CNAU and its research and its programs, you're more than welcome to contact Marco um, directly. Thank you, Marco, once again.
Thank you. Um, unfortunately, Mario Sapinski uh, had a personal emergency, um, but instead, um, um, uh, Mauricio Bretonar from CERN has uh, agreed to step in to present uh, the accelerator complex for the next generation heavy eye in therapy and research facilities. Um, um, Mauricio, it's a pleasure to have you with us. Thank you for accepting to come um, at a very short notice. Um, and I give you the floor. Thank you, Nicolas. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so as Nicolas said, I just uh, dis discovered half an hour ago that I had to, uh, to give this presentation. It's going to be very short. Uh, also, and also I know that you are uh, eagerly waiting for your coffee. So it's not going to take much time. The goal is to show you what uh, are the what is the complex foreseen for the Southeast European Institute for Sustainable Technologies, which is the complex uh, a next generation heavy ion therapy and research facility. The important point is that uh, this facility is intended to uh, run 50% of the time for research and 50% of the time for treatment. So you will see that uh, in the layout, uh, this corresponds to a larger space and relevance even to the experimental rooms as compared to the other facilities. But this is an artist's view uh, of, of the complex, actually more than an artist's view, is the, a, an architect view, uh, where you see the different uh, buildings uh, of, the, of, uh, of the complex. And uh, uh, with the open roof, uh, the accelerator part uh, here in the middle. So the roof, the components inside. So the two buildings that you see here, one is the medical building and the other is the administration. What is, uh, of course, not shown here is a, a hospital nearby because uh, the hope is that uh, even if the landscape here, is what you see is really wonderful, uh, the hope is that this center should be close to a, to a hospital that uh, would allow a lot of synergies and interactions in uh, sending the patients from the hospital to the facility. Uh, for the accelerator part, uh, what you see here, so it is uh, underground and uh, uh, the, the, the roof, let's say, of the facility, of the accelerator part uh, is more or less at the ground level. Access uh, is through uh, some ramps. Here you see one of the ramps. And uh, uh, what I can show you here is that uh, on the right side here you see the synchrotron. The, the injector is here, this is the synchrotron. The beam lines are there. The treatment rooms are on the top in this drawing and the, the, uh, the experimental rooms are here on the bottom. And what you see here, this large structure is a gantry of the type that uh, uh, Manuela and uh, uh, Marco were showing in the previous talks. So it's actually the same, uh, the same gantry. This uh, facility is uh, somehow uh, inspired by uh, what exists uh, already uh, in Europe in terms of, uh, of, of uh, uh, ion, th ion therapy facilities, but uh, we didn't want to run, for example, in, in all the promise of space that uh, uh, there are in Heidelberg, where really the facility had to be uh, built very close to a hospital, in a piece of land that was a of in the dimensions, and so you see that everything is, is very compact. So we wanted to have space in the direction of Medaustron, that you see here in the bottom, where it is much, much more expanded, but probably not so much, so to, to rearrange things in a different way. And this is the result. This is what uh, we have worked out last year as a kind of an optimized layout for uh, the CIS facility. So. We started with the idea that there are no space constraints so that uh, we can take uh, as much space as we want, but we didn't want to take more than, than a certain space. And uh, I can't read here, but uh, all this is 6,500 square meters. And uh, 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 what you see again here is are the ion sources, the near accelerator, the synchrotron, which is of PIMS layout, the, trans the transport the transfer line, and the three treatment rooms. One with horizontal and vertical beam, one with horizontal only, and the other with the rotating gantry, superconducting as you've seen before. So uh, 
the treatment rooms are quite large, so we have taken some space, 10 meters between irradiation points, with the goal of uh, uh, leaving space for uh, additional equipment, uh, in particular diagnostics, uh, that uh, could be added later on uh, in the facility. So for the moment, uh, one room has an horizontal and vertical uh, beam, but clearly so if we have uh, a good and not expensive solution for the gantry, this room could host a second, a second rotating gantry. So horizontal and vertical is quite complex, in fact. What you see also is that uh, on the on top, uh, so there are the treatment rooms, and on the bottom uh, there is uh, uh, there are the experimental lines. Experimental lines. Uh, this is in a reconfigurable room, uh, using let's say the CERN approach of having a big room with an overhead crane moving around components uh, and uh, shielding blocks uh, to build any kind of uh, shielded area that could be needed uh, around the experiments. Uh, so at the moment, there are, in this drawing, there are two beam lines going in this room. In case one of these lines can be split in two, so to have three experiments, and all this part is foreseen that can be expanded. So there is a, the idea is to leave an area around this, let's say, bunker that hosts the accelerator and the line part. So on this side and on the other side, this can be expanded for few, in future to add more treatment rooms and more experimental space. A small area here is reserved for uh, animal preparation, and there is a separate access for animal access. In particular, we wanted to separate completely the access for uh, treatment, so the medical part, uh, you can access from here, and the experimental part, uh, you access from there. Not that you don't want to, uh, to mix the medical part with experimenters, but uh, for the patients, it's better to keep the experimental part out of sight, let's say, and keep, let's say, kind of a medical uh, environment in this uh, part on the top of the facility. So, uh, what else? Ah, yes, also I had to, uh, to mention that, uh, of course, the ion source area is accessible during operation. So you see there's been quite a, quite, a work, quite a lot of work going into separating the different shielding areas and accesses. So also from the point of view of safety, to always have uh, uh, two accesses to any, any area. Uh, and, but also for the LINAC, the idea is that uh, at the end of the LINAC, uh, the beam can go either in the synchrotron or to a small room with a target where radioactive isotopes can be produced. Because actually, an, an injector linear, DINAC, that is feeding uh, a synchrotron for, uh, for therapy, works with a very low duty cycle. Only one per mil of the time of the LINAC is actually used for injection into the synchrotron. The idea is that the rest of the time, this uh, uh, LINAC can be used for uh, producing production of radioisotopes in the sense that. Uh, uh, pulses can be sent to the production of the production of radioisotopes, and from time to time, one pulse will be sent to the synchrotron for filling the synchrotron for treatment. And these radioisotopes, so this is only the, uh, the, the, the target area here, but in case this option is taken by the deceased, then there will be a large preparation area for the, uh, for the isotopes and for the pharmaceuticals that have to be produced with the radioisotopes in producing this area. Okay, so uh, what I have uh, here, what Mario has prepared here, is uh, uh, the same facility day out in case uh, it is built uh, using a superconducting synchrotron or uh, a high frequency LINAC. So basically, the message here is that uh, uh, going to more compact accelerators, uh, you can gain a lot in the surface uh, taken by the accelerator, but not really much in the overall facility, because uh, the space required for treatment and experimental rooms and for the, for the beam uh, distribution to the rooms uh, is very large. Actually, uh, the accelerator part here with Synchrotron and Linux is about 50% what it is with, um, with the uh, room temperature conventional synchrotron, 
while uh, the overall saving in the surface is only 15%. However, uh, clearly, the superconducting uh, uh, solution, for example, here for the synchrotron, is something that uh, has a lot of uh, perspectives uh, to build uh, future compact facilities. Uh, and so, if uh, superconducting magnets will be developed on time, the uh, program for CIST is uh, to, uh, to be superconducting if there is more time needed before construction and if the R&D on the superconducting magnet is going to be completed in four or five years from now as is foreseen. Okay, and this is what uh, Mario had prepared for, uh, for this presentation. Thank you so much, Mauricio, for that lovely talk about uh, this future uh, design for, for a future um, um, uh, facility, um, uh, which uh, um, uh, hopefully will come to, to fruition in the Balkan region. Are there any questions? Uh, no questions, uh, Nicolas. Okay, we have had a very long session, so I'm not surprised, in fact. Um, thank you, Maurizio, once again for your um, uh, for your presentation, thank you, and for coming at a short notice. Um, okay, we will uh, uh, break off for a coffee break, and we will be back at uh, uh, four o'clock um, for the rest of our program.